Welcome to this week's Money Metals Podcast, helping gold and silver investors during these treacherous times. Now, here's this week's market wrap with commentary and analysis from the company voted 2015's Precious Metals Dealer of the Year in the U.S., Money Metals Exchange. Welcome to this week's Market Wrap Podcast. I'm Mike Leeson. Coming up, we'll hear from Keith Newmeyer, founder and CEO of First Majestic Silver, an outspoken voice on the manipulation that's occurring in the futures market for silver. Keith weighs in on the Deutsche Bank market rigging case, gives us his outlook for metals under a Trump presidency, and explains how silver's gains in the future may end up making the recent advance in zinc look like child's play. I can promise you will not want to miss an incredible interview with Keith Newmeyer coming up after this week's market update. Precious metals markets continue to show strength in 2017 as we finish out the second trading week of the year. So far in 2017, gold, silver, platinum, and palladium are all on the upswing. So is copper, uranium, rhodium, and other hard assets. The gold market closed Thursday back near $1,200 per ounce and a seven-week high. As of this Friday recording, gold continues to run into overhead resistance at the $1,200 level and currently comes in $1,194 and is up 1.7% or $20 since last Friday's close, a third consecutive weekly gain of 20 bucks. Turning to silver, spot prices currently come in at $16.77 an ounce to register a weekly gain of 1.3%. It's not clear yet whether silver will lead gold in 2017. The gold to silver ratio has been oscillating around 70 to 1 over the past few months and currently stands at around 71 to 1. We'll also be watching the platinum to gold ratio this year. It has been depressed for some time. An ounce of platinum last sold for the same price as an ounce of gold in late 2014. Platinum now sells at a sizable discount, which makes it attractive for bargain hunters. Platinum prices are up 1.1% this week to $982 an ounce, while palladium, which has been white hot of late, is pulling back slightly and is now down 0.7% to trade at $754. The stock market rally, meanwhile, keeps stalling out whenever the Dow Jones Industrials approaches the 20,000 level. Traders still aren't quite sure what the Donald Trump presidency will bring. The latest consumer and business sentiment readings show a huge surge in optimism, Trump will ride a wave of hope and high expectations into his formal inauguration next week. Even though he's not yet president, he's already wielding enormous influence in the economy. Trump moved markets again this week by reiterating vows to negotiate for lower prescription drug prices and defense contracts. Drug makers, aircraft makers, automakers, and any manufacturer thinking of outsourcing jobs out of the country risk being trumped by an incoming president if he doesn't like the way they do business. There are potential benefits to taxpayers in having one of the world's most aggressive negotiators as our president. Trump could single-handedly stop billions of dollars in wasteful spending and padding bills from contractors that previous presidents have ignored. But when he orders corporations to keep domestic factories open under the threat of punitive taxes, he risks crossing the line into central planning. Will Trump take drastic steps to intervene in the economy if it goes into recession? Will he dispatch the plunge protection team if the stock market crashes? Will he seek to drain the swamp of shadowy market manipulators or look the other way when their price rigging schemes suit his agenda? We will soon find out. Our next president has publicly gloated about the post-election stock market rally and the uptick in consumer sentiment. It's likely that as president, He'll be personally invested in keeping markets propped up by whatever means he can. President Trump may learn to become a fan of the Federal Reserve and of stimulus schemes on steroids, if need be. He'll have a Republican Congress on his side that seems eager to put its stamp on new spending. Despite all the talk of repealing Obamacare, federal spending on various health care programs will continue to surge. Medicare reform is off the table. A balanced budget is off the table. But what's on the table is more debt. On Monday, the Senate rejected an amendment by Rand Paul to freeze federal spending and balance the budget over three years. Senator Paul's balanced budget amendment failed by a vote of 83 to 14. In other words, the forces of bigger government continue to enjoy an insurmountable supermajority. That's the reality investors have to face. At some point, spiraling debt levels will wreak havoc on the bond market and send inflation rates much higher. 
There is just as strong a case for accumulating precious metals under Republican control of Washington as there would under Democrat rule. In summary, there is unprecedented uncertainty about how Donald Trump will actually govern. He is an outsider with no track record in elective office. That makes the case for owning precious metals now even stronger than if Hillary Clinton or a more predictable Republican was heading into the White House. Well, now for more on the metals, manipulation, and a growing supply deficit for silver, let's get right to this week's exclusive interview. It is my privilege now to bring in Keith Newmeyer, founder and CEO of First Majestic Silver Corp, one of the top silver mining companies in the world. Keith has an extensive background in the resource and finance sectors and has also been an outspoken voice about the manipulation that has been occurring in the futures market pricing of silver. It's a real privilege to have him on with us again today. Keith, thanks so much for joining us and welcome back. Well, thanks, Mike. And uh, I think we've got, to, we've got lots of juicy things to talk about. Yeah, we certainly do. And uh, to start off here, Keith, and, and before we get into the subject of manipulation, which I definitely want to cover with you today, uh, next week, Donald Trump will be sworn in as the next president here in the United States, and it will mark a new era in American politics. It will also mark the first time in nearly a decade that we don't have a Democrat in the White House. So it's, it's a new environment here for metals investors. And, and we know many are wondering what a Trump presidency is likely to mean for metals and commodities as a whole. Uh, what are your thoughts on the subject? Will Trump and his policies ultimately be good or bad for precious metals? Well, I'm not even sure who in the office of the presidency really matters. It's gone through decades of presidents and, and Donald Trump, he talks a good story. And uh, I know there's lots of optimism around him taking on the presidency. You know, it's interesting that during the election campaign, everyone is saying doom and gloom if uh, Trump gets in. And now everyone's saying, you know, it's going to be great for the world. But he's coming in, it's going to industrialize the United States, and it's going to be great for metals and, and, and you know, copper, uranium's moving, everything seems to be moving, the Dow's hitting new highs or, or close to new highs, and, you know, S&P's doing the same thing. So there's tens, you know, there's, there's a ton of euphoria surrounding all of this, but I think we're just going to go back to the normal thing that we've been noticing or witnessing for the last decade, where the Federal Reserve continually does what it does and manipulates markets and uh, prints money, and I think all that will be very supportive for precious metals. Keith, you have been an outspoken advocate for more honest metals markets and price discovery for years now. Uh, the people at GATA, the Gold Antitrust Action Group, yourself, and, and many others have been making the case for manipulation, and it was certainly well supported with plenty of evidence. But it wasn't until recently that we got smoking gun evidence turned over by Deutsche Bank as part of their settlement in a civil class action suit. There are chat logs and voice recordings of metals traders at major bullion banks planning and executing schemes to cheat their own customers and other players in the market. So I'm sure none of this was surprising to you, Keith, but what went through your mind when you saw the transcripts and read up on this information, which was recently released? Well, I think vindication would be the simplest uh, way of describing it. Yeah, I think that people sometimes put me in a bit of a you know, quack category, even though I, I don't look at myself that way at all. I, being an ex-trader myself and knowing how the financial markets work and uh, seeing a lot of things that are happening on a daily basis uh, with my own eyes, I know that this stuff happens. And, and, and it's been shocking to me that there's been so many people that are saying, no, no, it's not possible. There's no manipulation. You know, we see the LIBOR uh, scandal. We've seen other scandals where uh, manipulation has been proven. There's been billions and billions of dollars in fines paid by the banks for uh, manipulating a variety of different markets. Yet for some reason, people said, oh, no, the gold and silver market are unique. They're, they're not manipulated, which <laughs> is a complete joke. And then, of course, they are manipulated and have been manipulated for you know over 30 years. And and it's nice to see that uh, one of the banks has come out and, and, and actually admitted to it, and uh, I think that's going to create a whole uh, series of events occurring over the next couple of years, and I'm optimistic that the banks will get out of the market and we will see true price discovery um, as a result. You spoke directly with one of the attorneys leading the class action suit against Deutsche Bank and a handful of others. Uh, tell us what you can about that conversation. Are you expecting First Majestic to join that class, or would you expect to form a, a new class, perhaps represent producers specifically? What did you learn that you can share with us publicly? 
Yeah, well, I actually had a thought of doing something specifically from the producers, but unfortunately, the mining companies, for the most part, aren't very supportive of this. I, I don't really know why, whether they just don't want to waste their time or feel like they're wasting their time in dealing with lawyers or paying legal bills or, you know, or spending management time on these types of issues. I, I just can't speak for them. But, you know, I know it's it's important to me personally. It's important to our shareholders. It's important to our our employees and, and the communities that we're active in. So I feel it's, it's our responsibility. It's my responsibility to at least try to do something to, to create change. And, and, and that's what I've been doing. So I did reach out to the lawyers um, that are involved in this particular case. It is a bit of a long process. Um, it's not been deemed a class action lawsuit yet. Um, I know a lot of the headlines have been kind of misquoting the, the actual lawsuit, but they're trying to get it elevated to a class action lawsuit. Once it does get elevated, assuming they're successful in doing it, then that's the time where other plaintiffs, such as First Majestic, would then jump onto the case. And I've made it quite clear to the lawyers involved in this that First Majestic would be willing uh, to join if, if they felt it, it would help the situation, either prior to it being elevated to a class action lawsuit or as it gets elevated to a class action lawsuit were available uh, in either case. Um, so we're basically just on hold and, and waiting to see how this all transpires. Do you have an opinion about the settlement amount at Deutsche Bank, roughly $100 million combined for, for rigging and, and gold and silver? Is it reasonable? Will, will the evidence that they provided likely yield much larger settlements or damage awards for other banks involved? Well, you know, what, what is reasonable, I really, you know, because you see these markets get whipped around the way they do, and, and, and these banks are making you know, hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars in profits over several years and basically manipulating these markets. Now, they may not call it manipulation, but, you know, as far as I'm concerned, it is manipulation. But um, nevertheless, um, you know, how do you put a value on, on that type of profit? And you, do you, you go back 20, 30 years, I think it almost becomes impossible to put an actual value on, on, on the damage that they've created, the amount of jobs worldwide that get lost as a result of metal prices dropping in the way that they have over the last five years, uh, market caps that have been erased by 50% or more in some cases, and, and, you know, the list goes on and on and on. So, you know, the, the damage is in the, you know, multi, multi-billions. Uh, I just don't know what a judge would actually uh, deem true value of, of such uh, activity. I know you've been trying to recruit others in your space to come out against these price manipulation schemes. You spoke about that a moment ago, and, and you've decided to, to hold back some of your production in, in, in uh, the past and not release it onto the market because you believe the price was being suppressed. But it's confusing to us how you can be getting so little support from your mining executive colleagues when it comes to, to raising a stink about the manipulation that is so clear now, we're not in the industry ourselves, uh, but we do follow it fairly closely. But it, it seems to me if I were running a business that was being adversely affected by the schemes being carried out by some of these low-life traders and trading institutions to suppress the price of the product my company sells, uh, that I would be doing whatever I could to shine a light on these practices. But that's not the case, and it's really just you that's talking about this manipulation publicly. Why is that, Keith? Are they beholden to the same banks that we're asking them to speak out? Out against here? What, what What is it? You know, I just think it's, you know, the characters of the individuals that run many of these mining companies. I've said multiple times that executives that run mining companies tend to be conservative. You know, the mining industry is a very conservative industry. It's an industry that's always got its head down and trying to always do what's right, because often the mining industry does come under some extra scrutiny because it's deemed a dirty business by some individuals. And, and so I think that you know, mining executives tend to shy away from from things that um, you know could put a spotlight on them or their companies. You know, I'm just not of the same ilk. I, I think that uh, it's very important to speak up, and and uh, it is frustrating for me that there aren't more executives out there that are are joining the fight because I do think it's important. As one of our recent uh, podcast guests, uh, Bill Holter, said, it's no longer conspiracy fiction, it's a conspiracy fact, this whole manipulation scheme. And, yeah, it'd be great to see some others 
really uh, recognize that there's uh, something that needs to be done here, and obviously it's uh, it's truly happening. Uh, now, in, an, in another interesting story that's uh, come out recently, uh, WikiLeaks published a memo sent from London to the U.S. Treasury Department in 1974, before the futures markets for gold and silver were established. It discussed the expectations that the futures markets would discourage ownership of physical metal, they de anticipated that paper trading would dwarf physical trading and, and that there would be tremendous volatility. It certainly looks like they got exactly what they've, they were expecting. Uh, what is your take on, on whether we can expect government regulators to, to ever take action? Uh, have you by chance seen any indication that the CFTC is looking at the evidence turned over by Deutsche Bank and considering charges themselves? What can you say there? Well, in my discussion I had with the lawyers that are involved in the case, you know, they did say that there is a variety of different government agencies looking into this. It's not just one agency. So, you know, they didn't want to get into too much specifics, and, you know, nor should I probably repeat exactly what they said. But they did say that it, it is being looked at very seriously, and, and uh, they're confident, or at least have some confidence, that um, there will be some action taken. But what that is at the end of the day, who knows, because, you know, we all, all know that, Unfortunately, the banks uh, are very powerful, and, 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 and the governments quite often don't even understand what the banks are doing because all the spoofing and, and high-frequency trading that takes place around the world, is it's very complex and it's very difficult to monitor and very difficult to police. And, you know, even the, the best regulators have a challenge uh, monitoring it all. So, you know, there is that. But, you know, I, I try to be optimistic, even though that uh, WikiLeaks piece that came out, which I did actually re retweet on my Twitter account, um, which, it, which for interest sake is uh, Keith underscore Newmeyer, but um, uh, I shouldn't have been surprised when I read it, uh, but I was actually quite surprised when I read it, and it was very clear that, you know, the paper trading that was created back in the 70s was, was created for the purpose of dissuade, dissuading, you know, Americans particularly uh, from owning physical metal, and uh, you you put all these pieces together, and 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 uh, you know the unlimited short positions that you know, that institutions and banks can carry in the metals environment or precious metals, and and, and look at the governments uh, are not wanting people to actually own metal. So there's a lot of reasons why this game can continually go on and on and on. But um, you know I am uh, confident that there is change afoot with individuals like Trump and some of the government officials in Europe who've lost their old posts. You know, so we are seeing a bit of a changing in the guard worldwide, and then I'm, I'm hopeful that over time that as new you know, politicians come in and start running these governments in a more transparent way, that you know, we will get pro proper down, uh, true discovery or price discovery in markets. What can the average metals investor do here, Keith? For instance, should shareholders of mining companies be calling into the investor relations departments and, and urging the managements to speak out about the manipulation and strongly encourage the executive team to, to join Keith Newmeyer in the fight against futures market manipulation? Uh, what can people do, Keith? Well, you know, it's frustrating to me to see my name in the headlines by myself. I would like to see mining companies are, are fighting against, have a collective group of companies get together and, and, and fight this action. But uh, there's, the will out there just doesn't seem to be there. And, and as I said, it is quite frustrating for me. And, and for investors or shareholders out there who are listening to this podcast, um, you know, feel free to do that. I, you know, we at, at First Majesta get regular emails, you know, for the last several years from the investors demanding that we take action. And, and uh, of course, they send us, you know, all the stuff that you can imagine gets uh, printed or, 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 or broadcast. We get everything from our shareholders. So, you know, we, we know what people are saying out there. And I, I would imagine... If First Majestic is getting all this information and, and all this pushing from our investors, I'm sure other mining companies must be also getting the same kind of emails from their people as well, but I just don't see it, it taking an effect, unfortunately. Last year, there was a fantastic but brief run-up in prices during the first half of the year in the mining sector, but uh, here we are with prices back at or, or below the cost of production for miners with marginal deposits. Uh, nevertheless, prices are, are certainly well above their late 2015 lows. Uh, we know First Majestic has some great properties and, and low cost of production compared to, to many others in your space, but talk generally about how miners are doing. Are, are people able to raise capital where needed? Are, are enough operators profitable at current prices? What's the state of the industry here? And, and give us your outlook for this year, both for the miners and then also for the bullion itself. 
Well, I suppose it depends on what country you're in. If you're a producer in the United States, you're, you, you've got more challenges because the currency that your costs are based in has gone up substantially. Your revenue also is based in U.S. dollars, so it's been, it could be a wash. But in countries like Mexico, for example, or many other countries around the world, uh, operators in those countries, even in Canada, have done much, much better because of the currency. We're selling metals in, in U.S. dollars, and our costs are in pesos or Canadian dollars or, or what have you, depending on where you're located. But in addition to just currency moves, you know, the mining industry has improved itself quite a lot over the last five or six years, you know, out of necessity, obviously. And, you know, the miners are resilient. We do often sometimes in bull markets, you know, go out on spending sprees and and that's exactly what happened. And a lot of debt was accumulated and a lot of marginal assets were brought or, or purchased or brought into production. And that has now all been un- unwound. You know, the, the balance sheets of mining companies are in much healthier positions today. First Majestic, for example, has got more cash in the bank today than it ever has in the history of the company. It's been in business for 15 years. So, um, you know, the profits are coming in the door. And, you know, not that silver at 16 bucks is that exciting, but, but nevertheless, you know, we're making money at $16 um, an ounce. And I can tell you clearly four or five years ago, if silver was at sixteen bucks, we would have been we we would have been losing money. Uh, so I think we've done a great job in reducing our costs, and then the miners across the board have. Every dollar makes a huge difference, you know, particularly for for First Majestic and many other other larger companies, you know, because if you're producing, you know, twenty million ounces of silver a year, an extra dollar an ounce, that's twenty million extra dollars that most of that just drops right to the bottom line. So the the leverage is pretty good, um, and you know we've seen silver go from thirteen. 30 low uh, in, in February to, you know, $21 high in, in uh, August, and now it's back to 16 So it's been a very volatile year. It's been hard for investors or shareholders to kind of stomach the, the move, but um, the miners are doing okay, so I'm optimistic. You know, once we get um, a little bit of fire onto this market and then uh, this bull market is actually moving, you know, uh, as we expect it's going to be moving over the next year or two, you know, I think the stocks are the mining stocks are going to do very very well just because of the fact that they're much much healthier today than they were previously. Well, as we begin to close here, Keith, any final comments uh, on maybe the supply situation in silver? Uh, I know we've, we've been reading some interesting things about that and how we're dipping further into a deficit there. Any other closing comments here before we wrap up? Yeah, you know, there's uh, silver's always been in a deficit, you know, at least for the most part. Um, it's in another deficit. It's just continually deficits, and that's been burning away at the um, above ground supplies of the metal, uh, which which you know really hasn't shown up in price, and which is surprising to me because it hasn't really caught on that that there is actual supply issues with silver. Um, you know, quite interestingly, you know, everyone's hearing about the zinc story, and zinc's gone from basically eighty cents to buck twenty five. It's corrected a little bit now, but you know, that's a pretty major move on zinc. And you know, the whole talk behind that is you know, zinc is in is in a shortage. Well it is it is in a short shortage because a couple of mines did close, but it's not in a deficit. And also that shortage is going to fix itself by twenty eighteen with another couple of mines opening. So you know, this is a very short-term phenomenon, but yet, you know, people are all all getting excited about this zinc story, which is fine short-term, but longer-term, it really doesn't make make much sense to be getting too excited about zinc. Silver, so, mind you, every single year we have a we have a deficit, and it's been going on and on and on and on. And uh, consumption of the metal continually rises. We've had a couple of years of consecutive production uh, decreases on a global scale. And we're mining, you know, as I've said many times, nine to one for every one ounce of gold. We're only mining nine ounces of silver, and we're trading at about 70 to one, which just does not make any sense to me. So I think there's going to be a huge supply squeeze in silver, and then, uh, you know, investors should be looking at the silver space quite seriously, in my view. Yeah, we certainly agree that it uh, should get very exciting for silver at some point, not uh, if, but when. And uh, when it does, it'll be uh, certainly uh, great for all of us who've been following the space and have long since been uh, investing in the metals and the miners. And uh, I think that day uh, will come at some point here before long. Well, Keith, we certainly uh, want to thank you for your efforts and, and for you sharing your comments with us today. And we wish you and your businesses continued success. Great to hear about uh, where you're at here uh, right now with First Majestic. And to that end, before we let you go, please tell listeners about how they can get more information on First Majestic and also First Mining Finance. We didn't get a chance to speak about that today. Uh, so anyone wanting to potentially invest in either of those companies can find out more. Tell them how they can do that. 
Yeah, well, you know, all three, well, myself, you know, we are, I have a Twitter account, you know, First Money Finance, First Majestic Silver, both on Twitter as well. Look them up there for, for regular announcements on, on the, the happenings of, of uh, those companies and, you know, obviously their websites, firstmajestic.com or firstmoneyfinance.com. Or please feel free to call uh, the, the 1 800 numbers um, and ask for investor relations, uh, Derek at uh, First Mining and Todd Anthony at uh, uh, first Majestic Silver, they're, they're both there to answer any questions, and I would suggest that people, if they're looking at these companies, they should call the company for due diligence. Well, excellent stuff. Thanks again, Keith. We sincerely appreciate it, and uh, we hope we can catch up with you again before long, and uh, also uh, wish you a great weekend, and take care. Well, thanks very much, and Happy New Year, and let's uh, hope that uh, we're going to see much, much higher metal prices by the end of 2017. Absolutely. Well, that will do it for this week. Thanks again to Keith Newmeyer, founder and CEO of First Majestic Silver Corp, ticker symbol AG on the New York Stock Exchange, one of the largest and most successful primary silver producers in the world. And don't forget to check back here next Friday for our next weekly market wrap podcast. Until then, this has been Mike Leeson with Money Metals Exchange. Thanks for listening and have a great weekend, everybody. Thank you for joining us for this week's Money Metals podcast. Be sure to come back next week. And don't forget to subscribe to our podcast through iTunes for answers to all of your questions or to discreetly and securely buy or sell gold or silver coins, bars, and rounds. Call 1-800-800-1865 or visit www.moneymetals.com. Our knowledgeable and no-pressure specialists are standing by between 7 a.m. and 5.30 p.m. Mountain Time, Monday through Friday. Or you can lock in your order online, 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Again, visit us at www.moneymetals.com or call 1-800-800-1865.